and uh, welcome to tonight's audit and governance meeting. Um, item one, uh, apologies for absence. I've got John Chesworth. Um, there wasn't anybody else, was there? Because everybody else is here. All right, uh, minutes of the previous meeting. Can I sign those as a true record? Happy Moved second, by. Chair. Okay, thank you. Moved by Councillor Ford, seconded by Councillor Peeble. Declarations of interest item three. Anybody have any? Seems to be making a lot of buzzing noise. No? Okay then. Um, item four then. Um, oh, before I get really going into the agenda, just a reminder we've got a private meeting with the auditors at the end of the meeting, as you may have noticed probably no more than about 10-15 minutes or longer if we can keep him <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah so that's tacked on to the end um, of, of this agenda um, obviously we've also got a confidential item coming up as well at the very end um, item four then appointment of external auditor um, so uh, this uh, is the PSAA process that we um, opt into rather than doing it ourselves um, so it's just really a formality to say we want to do it, but I'll let uh, Stefan take over from here and just explain it in a bit more detail. Thank you, Chair. Yes, the report advises members of the options, process and legislative requirements to appoint our external auditors, auditors for the accounting period from 2023-24 for a period of likely five years and seeks member endorsement for, of the recommended option for the for the subsequent cabinet and council approval. Um, as members will be aware, local authorities are required under the legislation to appoint their own external auditors. Um, and obviously the, the next time that is, uh, that is due or the, the current contract ends is from 2023 uh, This is a full council decision. So it will have to go to full council once this committee has uh, considered the recommendation. The Local Audit and Accountability Act 2014 requires us to uh, decide between opting in to uh, one, of, one of the following or the options detailed in the report. Uh, namely, option one is to use the, the Public Sector Audit Appointments Limited under the Appointing Persons Regime uh, and the Local Audit Appointing Person Regulations 2015, which just for information, 98% of all councils did that the last time it was tended in 2016-17. Or option two, which would mean undertaking our own procurement exercise. In terms of the considerations, uh, option one, the, uh, the sector-led procurement using PSA, a least de demand, uh, demanding in terms of resource, time and cost on, on the council and its officers. It's undertaken on a much larger scale of, for obvious reasons will or should lead to more competitive rates and it, it, it also uh, there's the opportunity for an increased pool of audit sector partners it's probably the best opportunity to secure a suitably qualified and registered auditor there are only nine accredited auditors uh, who can do this work uh, and obviously it, it will, will actually re result in reduced costs in undertaking the process which is quite onerous, as you will see in the report, if, if we have to do it locally. In terms of uh, option two, which is undertaking our own uh, procurement exercise, we'd have to establish a local audit panel. Uh, the impact on time and cost probably wouldn't deliver efficiencies and economies of scale, and it could lead to us not appointing a suitably qualified auditor for the, for the period from 2023-24. Uh, as outlined in the report, option one, uh, provides the most cost-effective and the the most uh, benefit in terms of achieving a lower audit base fee due to the economies of scale. Um, we won't know the exact cost until the the audit exercise has been uh, undertaken until the procurement exercise has been undertaken. The main risk is we fail to appoint an auditor and we don't achieve EFM. Uh, and the best, the, the, you know, the consideration is it's best mitigated by opting into the sector-led approach, which 98% of councils did last time. Happy to take any questions, Chair. Thanks. Um, I think you've really sold the DIY option, so we'll go for that, shall we? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, Councillor Ford, you were first, and then Councillor Peter. 
Uh, thank you, Jet. I think uh, uh, this is a relatively straightforward decision uh, just by the option, uh, the, the opening line of the resource indication that option one provides the most cost effective procurement option. Uh, I'm happy to move the recommendation, uh, both recommendations in the report. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a regular thing that we do. There's no need to uh, debate it, I don't think. Um, and I'm happy to second both recommendations. Brilliant. Okay. No more questions from anybody, I don't think. So um, it's, it, yeah. Uh, uh, the recommendations are simply that, uh, I mean, it says that Cabinet recommends to Council, but we recommend to Cabinet that they recommend to Council. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, um, we're endorsing the recommendation. To going to cab uh, going from cabinet to um, council that the authority opts into the uh, appointing person arrangements made by public sector audit appointments for the appointment of external auditors, auditors and that the executive director of finance which is Steph confirms our interest in undertaking the opt-in appointing process following ratification by council and has delegated powers in relation to the appointing process so it's been moved and second could I take a vote on that great that's all done and dusted thank you very much Right, um, so uh, we move on to item uh, five, uh, which is risk management quarterly update. Um, you're going to take it, obviously. Yes, thank you, Chair. Yes, Lynn's on holiday. <laughs> so yes, um, as you'll see, this is the, the regular quarterly risk management update report for the committee for the quarter two of the, the current financial year. Uh, should say now that the, the revised risk strategic risk register and reporting format has been approved by the committee, the work has started on developing the revised approach considering operational rather than strategic risks. Um, and an element of that will establish the link or aim to establish the link between operational and strategic risk reporting. During the last quarter, as an update, the development of the Risk Champions Group has been started and it's going to move forward with a planned workshop led by Zurich Municipal, uh, our, our risk consultant and insurer. Uh, once established, that group will meet quarterly prior to the strategic reporting timetable, which comes to this committee, to raise any operational risk issues that may need to be included in the strategic report. Uh, a copy of the current risk register, corporate risk registry is attached to Appendix 1. There's no significant changes in the strategic risks faced by the authority in the last quarter with the recovery from the COVID lockdown and its effect on the community and the impact on budgets being the most significant, as detailed in the appendix. However, a couple of issues have been raised within the, the report. The national shortage of HGV drivers, while it hasn't had a direct impact on services, it, it's likely that it could compound the, the price increases that we've seen across the board for supplies and labour for building and construction and maintenance works. Um, both, both the government and the Bank of England consider those to be a temporary issue. Uh, and there are also likely to be price rises for the council's energy supplies following obviously the, the, the demand in the market and the, the price rises that have been in the press recently. It won't have an immediate effect on our, our supplies or our prices because we actually buy our uh, energy in baskets through a, a, a framework and it's negotiated between October and March for the following financial year. So we're not going to see an effect this or in the coming months, but when it's renewed probably from April or later next financial year, we will start to see the effect of those price rises come through. Happy to take any questions, Chair. OK, thank you. Um, doesn't, oh, Councillor Peep. Sorry, Chair, I was held back because I thought you wanted to come in. Um, Firstly, with regard to the comment about price rises and them being only temporary, um, I think I'm too old to feel that prices come down very often once they've gone up. And whilst I'm sure that if something peaks at 100 and it was 80, it might not stay at 100, but I have a horrible feeling it will still be at 90 or so. So I think I think we will see some impact in, in the construction. Um, but the question I was going to raise was, um, following the budget yesterday, there were changes to the business rates regulations, which I would have thought should be something we would perhaps ask to be reported on um, at the next meeting as to what impact that's having or might have, because it's too quick to expect us to know exactly what impact it would have now. But 
it was confirmed that the rating system is going to change therefore what percentage we get to keep <laughs> um, may change um, the detail is usually where it all matters um, but also this fact that there would be a rates holiday and the extent to which that was going to be covered so if I could ask with the support of the committee chair that at the next meeting those issues are looked uh, are, are reported on in the in the quarterly report because uh, I wouldn't think it was reasonable to expect a, an answer tonight because we can't know very much yet. No, I mean obviously we've 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 all seen the the budget announcements and, and it's fifty percent for one year reduction for the retail, hospitality, and leisure businesses for next financial year. So that that was the main headline uh, change in terms of business rates. The other uh, change. Uh, if you like, and, and that's, this is where the, the big numbers are, are concerned, is freezing the multiplier from next year. So while it, it, it because it, uh, the multiplier increase, so the, the rate of inflation on business rates from next April should be based on September uh, CPI, which as, as, as you're probably aware, is 3.1%. So it should go by 3.1%, and then that's compounded every year. Obviously, if they freeze it, you don't get 3.1% next financial year and that's out of the business rate system so that's why it adds up to i think it, it was quoted around about seven billion pounds over the life of the the spending review period for the next five years so uh, that is a, a, a significant change um, what the government have said is we should be compensated as a council though through section 31 grants as as they currently do for the business rates process so we, we shouldn't see any uh, material impact in terms of our, our business rates collection because we'll we'll have that uh, compensated through the section 31 grants for the retail 50% relief for the retail hospitality and leisure and for the the frozen multiplier um, I'll probably cover this um, uh, or these issues within the base budget report that will be coming to cabinet at the end of uh, no, uh, no, beginning of December together with we've got the, the, the budget leaders budget, budget workshop at the beginning of December too so we can either cover it then or um, you know I could bring an update to the next committee but I don't think the next committee in, is until February so we we'll probably we we'll probably have covered this at um, well and there's joint scrut budget scrutiny committee in January as well so we'll probably have covered this by then already if we have covered it by then chair i'll be happy not to raise it again but I, I i think the point that stefan's very kindly made for me in a way is that the retail hospitality uh, sectors were two of the big ones and the last time we looked at the proportion of our rate revenue that was coming from ventura um you know it's a very significant element and the lack of a multiplier um, and I would refer you, if I may respectfully, Chair, to the former leader's comment about how government always promised to cover what they'd taken away, but they never quite did. So um, if he can say that from your side, um, I think I'm entitled to say we, we, we should at least by February have some idea how the Section 31 grant, because it's one thing to say you've lost this much revenue, so we'll give you that back. But the impact of the not having the multiplier you know, m some members here wouldn't re be as old as me and wouldn't remember when they didn't put up the garage uh, rents for two or three years. Um, and then suddenly, if you were going to put up the garage rents to try and recover the money to do them up, you actually needed a significant uplift. So, you know, this is like, well, you don't get that pay rise from your businesses coming into Tamworth the next, over the next four or five years. That 3.1% disappears and the two and a half percent that would have been on top of the 3.1 percent you know so it is a significant impact and whether we'll get compensated for that is a different story i think to the the half year's rent that you're not collecting so that's something that i think we just need to keep an eye on as we go forward chair and i'm quite happy if it's dealt with other things but um, maybe by the next meeting if it hasn't been all finalized stefan could uh, give us some more update thank you yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, um, I think it's um, as long as it's out of their share. <laughs> that's it. Um, but yes, uh, th there's some prevalent um, committees coming up, cabinet and the, and the budget workshop. So um, it's 
yeah, we're, we're too far away to have an update in between, but um, I should imagine we will be made fully aware of anything going on in that respect. So uh, the recommendation is that the committee endorses the corporate risk register. Um, so I'm happy to move that second. Uh, Councillor Thurgood, uh, all in favour of that? Yeah, thank you very much. Right then. Um, item. Item 6, Counter Fraud Update Report of the Audit Manager, over to yourself, Andrew. Thank you, Chair. I would like to present to committee my annual report on the counter fraud work completed during the year, together with an updated fraud action plan and fraud risk register. In addition, I'd like to bring for your attention the updated and refreshed strategy and policies in respect of counter fraud and corruption, whistleblowing policy and anti-money laundering policy. Counter-fraud work has included continuing review of COVID-19 related grant applications, which have included small business, hospitality, leisure and discretionary grant awards. This work is ongoing and the counter-fraud officer is continuing to support the assurance processes. We've also undertaken reviews of data matches through the National Fraud Initiative and this year we are taking part in an exercise around council tax single person discounts and electoral registration matches. We're working with management to ensure that those data matches are, and submissions are completed by the 28th of January. Our routine counter fraud work has continued and this includes work around NNDR, council tax reduction, single person discount, subletting and non-residents of council housing. The results to the end of September are included in the table attached to the report and committee, committee will note the work undertaken and the values of savings obtained. Through our current work on single person discount, we've also identified a further £963 worth of savings and this work continues to go forward, um, which again, as part of the exercise, we're, we're identifying um, those savings. My counter fraud officer has also been undertaking proactive housing related checks at application stage and reviewed 48 right to buy applications, eight waiting lists and also three credit checks as well. In line with good practice, I include the Council's Fraud Response Plan, which is included as Appendix 1, and this de details the work undertaken during the year and also the forthcoming work, which will, will be completed by the 31st of March. I provided commentary on that um, the Fraud Response Plan to actually identify when we completed each of those actions and also any work um, ongoing on, on there. Um, I've also reviewed the Fraud Risk uh, register which was updated up to the 30th September and that is included as appendix 2 of the report um, and again this has been reviewed but there haven't there haven't been any changes made to the fraud risk register the committee should be aware that in addition to taking part in the national fraud initiative we're also members of the Staffordshire County Fraud Partnership and also the Midlands Fraud um, Forum and this enables us to keep up to date with uh, ongoing fraud developments uh, within the sector and where we identify or any of those issues are flagged to us then we make the relevant officers aware within the council. Um, as part of my review of the count of counter fraud I've taken the opportunity to update and refresh the, the, strat the Council's strategies and policies around counter fraud. So those are contained within the append appendices 3, 4 and 5 and those basically contain the changes to job title since my predecessor left the authority and moved those over to um, myself as audit manager. And again, these have been updated just for minor changes and like I say around job titles and roles. Um, the main one really to note on that change of role was that my predecessor was also the monitoring officer well that now has actually been split split out now so now that's actually identified within the policies all policies have been reviewed by the corporate management team at its meeting on the 14th of October um, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have thank you I have found one problem <laughs> nothing major. Um, on, on the um, anti-money laundering policy uh, community impact assessment, you've just left Re Rebecca's name in there. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Other than um, that, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Councillor People. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the report. It's, uh, it's very interesting. Um, you mentioned finding sort of £963, um, which was 
fraudulent and obviously none of us want to to see fraud so that's fine the question it did though raise with me was are we spending more on countering fraud than we're catching that's first thing um i, d I appreciate there's always an element to that it's a bit like taking out insurance you, you always have to have it um but my second question is to my mind the deterrent effect of these sort of measures is in people knowing that the council does this um what what steps are taken to make people aware that they are you know that that people have been uh, identified so that if you like we get the maximum value out of the effort we're putting in because i presume you save an awful lot more by people not trying to make a fraudulent claim in the first place um, than you do by catching you know, whatever small numbers that are actually get through the system. So just uh, your views on that would be grateful. No, I, I'm certainly right around sort of the, the, co the costs around actually identifying fraud is, is, is high com compared because obviously the values of savings, you're only identifying those savings that you can actually prove and obviously then remove single person discount, for example. Um, again, I think the there there is that deterrent aspect, and I think one of the things that is beneficial with being within the Staffs County Fraud Partnership as well is using that that as a as almost as a leverage around that publication. I think that's where we need to do more going forward in relation to what is ha happening. Um, certainly within that the fraud the counter fraud partnership there is what they call um, spot the cheater which is basically publicized mainly within within Stoke City Council area for example but again is something that I'm, I'm currently having a look at um, because again those are certainly areas that we can we can have a look at and then potentially attach to our documentation and website around identifying where fraud does occur and also that we are pro proactive in mitigating that fraud as well thanks chair i mean obviously i'm not saying do we put a list of names up or anything but but the idea that some people have been caught is usually a deterrent against other people trying so so that that's i'm pleased to hear that we're thinking more about how we use that um to do it i do have to say though that it it, it struck me as, as interesting with such a focus on single person discount and the electoral register um given that the numbers actually registering in tamworth have gone down as seems to have been there's been a lot of downward pressure on the electoral roll um when i took part in the working group on the additional grants during covid there was certainly a concern that there were so many different grants and stream you know one was brought out and then maybe it hadn't addressed everything so another one was brought out has there been any comeback from um department of business i think it was was providing most of them um as to how we did did we did we manage to fit criteria and so on just that was a there was a lot of money involved there probably more than you'd ever find on the single person discount so i'm just wondering how we did as, as an authority in terms of their view um, yes um we've recently had the correspondence from it's bays who um who have been dealing with the business grants now we've done uh, throughout the, the business grants exercise we've had to do um sort of fraud assessments and risk assessments uh, around potential for fraud and, and checks before we actually send out the well, pre and post payment checks for, for businesses. For the first grant scheme, which was about £12 million, I think, at the start of the, the pandemic, uh, we've completed that, completed all the, the, the reconciliations and the, the fraud uh, assessments. They've all gone off to Bayes. For that scheme, I think we identified six uh, potentially, I'll call them potentially fraudulent claims of £10,000, so £60,000 out of £12 million. So it's a very small percentage. We've recovered three of those already, so which only really, yeah, which only leaves... Means they're not that potential. Then. <laughs> <laughs> We've, um, which only leaves three. One is a national fraud, 
So that affects um, a lot of councils nationally and, and Bayes will be taking that forward. Um, one of them is a local fraud that we, 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 we can't trace the, the fraudulent claim. And so um, we're in discussion with Bayes and how that's going to be taken forward. And then there is one more, uh, another local one that potentially uh, Bayes will uh, appoint a recovery agent to recover that money from, from them locally. Uh, so, but we've pursued, all, all, you know, as where we can, all of these already, and I say recovered three of them. Uh, in terms of the the uh, schemes after that, so you know, we've probably paid out uh, best part of twenty twenty five million pounds in grants uh, throughout the the second and third lockdown uh, schemes. We've just completed all the reconciliations on those schemes, uh, apart from the ARG because that is ongoing the uh, additional restrictions grant. We're, we've just had um, yeah, some webinars about uh, the assurance requirements for those schemes, and we'll be completing the risk assessments and sending all of that uh, information off to, to Bayes in the coming uh, months for them to review. So that they do a, 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 a very thorough uh, assessment process on the, the, the way the council has done pre and post uh, checks on all of the grant payments and basically they want assurance that we've we've done our job properly and not not just paid out the grants um you know willy-nilly and uh, not done any any checks if um, i can um, come in there to just say it sounds to me like we've done it very well and well hopefully the, the works because i remember at the meetings that we had you know there was a real sense of how to make sure that despite the fact that these criteria were just a little bit different to the other one that people didn't get the same grant or you know the same people didn't get the same grant and and you know so i, I think it's it's a really good um example of a well-managed approach because i mean we've already heard the numbers there and you can see what i was saying about the um the small the single person discount you know you can find <laughs> find 935 pounds um but this is talking about you know potentially hundreds of thousands in this case sixty thousand that was initially wrong and then got clawed back or sorted so I think this is you know a really good uh, example of well managed program under particularly difficult circumstances because nobody knew it was coming um, I think the officer has done a very good job Ch chair if I could also mention obviously our fraud officer has done you know the checks on you know thousands of these grant payments and that as part of her role so not only has she spotted these uh, these potentially fraudulent, fraudulent claims and you know got the SPD and there's other areas of her housing for example that she does work in and reduce those payments but potentially she spotted stuff before it's got sent out so that's prevented us actually paying that so there is a there's a lot of work already gone on in there and, and then the final point I was just going to make, um, and Andrew already mentioned about the, the staff's uh, county fr uh, fraud partnership. There, there was some comms um, probably in the early part of this year from the, the partnership that went county wide. So we, we do, uh, you know, do, do what we can to, to promote the message. And I think you've probably seen in the Herald in the past that uh, the portfolio holder does um, make statements now and again, doesn't he? So. Uh, I'll leave it there. Thank yeah, you, Jim. I was going to say, we normally get Rob Pritchard um, <laughs> popping up and saying, yes, we've caught these bad people. And, um, you know, it's, um, I would certainly like the deterrent to continue no matter how it, much it costs, to be honest. it's um, uh, it, Otherwise, it just spreads, doesn't it? Councillor Cooper, you had a question. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. Um, so, with regards to the, the, the person doing the work to, to catch the fraudulent claims and the, the proactive work she's done to stop these going out in the first place it's all fantastic work but are we just relying on one person to do this or is there a system in place that means that if that person was to ever leave the job somebody else could do it or or that actually a system picks it up automatically without the need of a, an individual check I'll, I'll start and then perhaps Andrew will, will come in um, I mean, the, the, the grants process is a good example because, no, it, it wasn't only, you know, the fraud officer was doing lots of checks through the national agencies, um, HM, HMRC uh, data, et cetera, et cetera. But we've, we, our team of staff in, in the building, 
uh, in, mainly in rev revenues, who were uh, processing the claims. They've got, they've got local knowledge, so they know the businesses. They were doing their own checks, you know, um, I won't say going out, but if there's any doubt, they, they, they do some more digging, looking at websites, for example, and making sure the people were who they said they were and they were trading. So it, it, that process isn't all on the fraud officer, uh, but we do have the fraud officer that focuses on those specific areas, and Andrew probably knows more about this than me, that, that like the, the housing, um, the, the rent stuff, the, the, the right to buy stuff, uh, the SPD checks, um, and, and and probably it's probably worth bringing uh, more information back on, you know, what we have achieved on uh, SPD uh, claims over the years to see perhaps, you know, because you've got a snapshot at one quarter, but if you add it up over the years, it's probably quite a big figure. Um, I think I've forgotten your second part of your question. <laughs> I think I think the second part of the question is more. A, is, is there no way we can we can sort of design a system that stops the 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 uh, necessity of a of a human check? Normally, in I normally find that um, systems are better than humans at, at doing that sort of thing. If you know what I mean. But you you have explained to me that it's more investigative work. So I imagine that that can't be taken over by some kind of system or computer algorithm. But is there any way that we can sort of automate it in such a way that we don't have to have so many checks in place. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that we certainly do have, certainly with sort of the National Fraud Initiative, a lot of that information is automatically generated and sent through to us. It's then, it does need an individual then to work through that information and tease out the information that is being provided because there may be some matches there that look fraudulent but then on further investigation they're actually not and I, I'm probably I'm probably thinking along here, here for example around payroll matches for example that we get and people or potential people with multiple jobs for example but it will throw it up as a it will throw it up as a data match to say that this individual is employed by XYZ authority and also by ABC authority but there may be a good reason behind that um, in, in relation to for example they could be a leisure assistant for example and they've got a part-time job at XYZ and they've got a part-time job at ABC but they come up as a data match because their NI number matches and bank account details match so they come up as a, a match but you need to then have the the person behind that to actually then review those matches and then tease out those which are actual um, fraudulent or possible fraudulent claims on on that um, again sometimes as well whilst it's national fraud initiative some of the data again I, we there's doubts around some of that data that we get and the integrity around the data um, and again going back to the point about single person discount and electoral registration for example those are national initi initiatives effectively through national fraud initiatives so we we buy into that to actually then sort of have a look at those those areas um, I think generally I think my I think yeah we we ideally we would like to have an automated system behind Id identifying it but I think I I find and and again my sort of previous experience certainly with within audit is having that person behind that to actually look at those and review those because you can get you can be in a, in a position for example of doing data matches on invoices for example and there can be thousands there that you you need to actually drill down into to actually review so i think i think yes we are reliant on one individual as the counter fraud officer but as as stefan has already indicated other officers within the council are also through the information that we provide through um, counter fraud, anti money laundering, and whistleblowing, etc., 
they've got the reporting processes and also they know the individuals to go to come to if they do have any issues it, it's probably worth saying as well chair that um you know i'd say probably all of our uh, internal processes have controls in place so take take benefits for example you know they'll require evidence before they pay benefit claims so all of those the, all of those control processes same like credit payments and whatever else those control processes are, are underpinning all of uh, the payments that we pay out anyway so what what the fraud officer does is take um, like a data matching exercise takes all that data goes off and goes through a big uh, national database to identify if there are potential frauds there that, that can we can follow up on but yeah all of our systems processes will have those controls in place and Andrew uh, and his team uh, of auditors you know check those controls on and external auditors um, you know on a regular basis thank you chair okay thank you um, uh, yeah I've, um, I've a little more faith in humans to be honest but um, uh, the um, I presume that our fraud officer is going to be uh, wondering what to do for the next year now. <laughs> is it done and dusted? <laughs> no, I'm sure she's going to be very busy. But um, uh, any further questions or queries, comments? No. Okay. Our um, our recommendations are that uh, we note the update report, including the updated fraud action plan and the fraud re risk register. Uh, endorse the refreshed counter fraud and corruption policy strategy. Endorse the refreshed whistleblowing policy. Endorse the refreshed anti money laundering policy. Uh, somebody to move that, please. Move off or Councillor Greatorex and seconded by Councillor Cooper. And uh, all in favour? That's great, that's sorted. Right then, um, moving on to the next agenda item, number seven, which uh, is the internal audit quarterly progress report. And uh, over to Andrew once more. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to present my report to committee on the internal audit work undertaken during quarter two of 2021-22, in addition to obviously the counter-fraud work that's already previously been reported. The focus of quarter two work has been the completion of the procurement uh, of internal audit services to ensure completion of the audit plan by the end of March 2022. As, as I outlined at the July meeting of this committee, the procurement exercise has now completed and we have engaged with TIA Business Services for General Auditor Service and ETEC for IT Auditor Services. The procurement exercise was completed in mid-August and initial work planning meetings were held at the start of September and both TIA and ETEC started delivery of audits in mid-September. This is reflected in the current quarter two report and I'll provide further update, further detail where I discuss the achievement of the audit plan. As part of the engagement and, uh, and again um, issues around um, previous issues that were raised by this committee, um, I asked ETEC Business Services to actually carry out an IT audit needs assessment for the council and this provides a plan of work for this year and this was discussed and agreed by management um, and includes the, for this year a review of IT backup and recovery and also the payment card industry standard com and compliance with that with those codes. In addition um, you will also see within the um, IT audit needs assessment there's future work which has also been identified um, which will be reflected in the work for 2022-23. I can report that there are no matters of fraud apart from the issues identified on single person discount or irregularity which have been identified from internal audit work. We've also not undertaken any additional consultancy or ad hoc work for management during quarter two and that relates to any work such as part of pro project groups or providing management advice, um, although we obviously have continued on doing audit work. I've been also, um, and again, the committee will will um, understand that I've been working with the assistant directors around the currently outstanding audit recommendations. And as part of that work during quarter two, the number of outstanding audit recommendations has reduced from 130 at the end of quarter one down to 75 as at the 30 September. Uh, these, co these quarterly reviews are on ongoing and will be maintained. 
There are currently 24 high priority recommendations which are outstanding, of which three are currently overdue and the remaining 21 have not actually re reached their due date and management are working towards their completion and that's part of my role when I have my quarterly re review to actually determine and, and, show, and, and identify the progress that's been made in those recommendations. The three o overdue recommendations are in the areas of GDPR and that is specifically around document retention and review on the Pentana system. And there's currently 6,000 documents that need to be reviewed and procedures have been developed to address this um, and work is continuing to, um, to sort that, those out. The other two areas are around health and safety and the, effectively it's the strategic risk register for a corporate health, health and safety. Uh, again, that was a recommendation which was high priority and basically we asked management to have regular reviews of that um, risk register. That is going to be taken to um, the corporate management team at the end of December and, and is scheduled in for an annual review. Obviously, one of the things that I do with all high priority recommendations is I basically wait, before I sign those off, I wait for evidence that those have been completed. So that's the reason why that is currently overdue. The other health and safety issue that was identified was around premise manager training. Um, and again, the assistant director is meeting with HR um, to progress this. The training materials for premise managers have, has, have actually been produced and they are basically ready to go on, on the astute system. And again, that just needs rolling out with HR, but the discussions are being undertaken between the assistant director and HR on that. So I will keep those under review um, and, and I'm expecting those to be completed by the end of the, end of the quarter. Again, as, as, as I've previously indicated, I, I do follow up all the high priority recommendations and I, and I obtain evidence from managers to ensure that those have been implemented. I'd like to br bring to the committee's attention the current position in relation to completion of the audit plan, which again was raised at the, uh, at the July meeting. Um, Again, this is, this is one of the areas that I've been concentrating on because the amount of actual, com of, of actual completion of the plan is extremely low uh, currently at this time. I've also discussed the arrangements of, with the audit plan with CMT and I held that on the 16th of September once we um, had procured both TIA and ETEC. Um, Within the quarter two report on the appendix one, I've outli I've I have outlined where we've scoped and briefed audits and stated where we're currently carrying out audit work. Now, one of the things that I will bring to your attention is that as this um, report is taken as at the 30th of September, obviously we, we started work on um, audits in mid-September towards the, the start of September into mid-September but those won't be showing as completed because we don't act the but the performance indicator in that area doesn't actually acknowledge the completion until the audit is fully completed and management have agreed recommendations. With this effect to provide assurance to the committee um, what I what I will say is that since the end of quarter two We've completed audits in the following areas, and those are basically the shared service arrangements for both legal services and joint waste. And between mid-September and the current date, we've also started audits on NNDR, creditors, the castle, and we've also scoped out the payment card industry um, audits as well. But those won't be reflected in, in, the, in the appendix. As I previously stated, these fall outside the scope of the quarter two report, but I wanted to reassure committee that we are progressing with the, with the, with the plan. One of the things that all, all the audits have been allocated within the plan to named individuals or to the specific service providers. And again, I've made CMT fully aware of, of those arrangements. As I outlined to the committee at the July meeting, 
We were expecting catch up with the audit work during quarter three and quarter four of this year. And as I've outlined, this is progressing. And I'll obviously keep committee and also management team fully appraised of the levels of the plan completion. My plan also for the catch up, um, as previously detailed, obviously we've got a number of, a number of audits that are currently ongoing. But within quarters three and quarters four, I thought it would be beneficial to outline that within quarter three, we were looking to, ha to uh, we haven't scoped these audits yet, but these are in, in the plan for quarter three, to review procurement, also to start having a look at the future high street fund. There was also within the, within the audit plan, housing white paper arrangements and preparations for that, and also to have a look at the assembly rooms. And then in quarter four, we were going to be having a look at assets and inventory, recovery and reset, and climate change. There were two other um, audits that we also carry out where we actually carry out assurance statements, and those are on disab disabled facilities grants and also the municipal charities, and those will be completed during quarter four. Um, I will obviously make any updates to the audit plan as appropriate and obviously keep committee appraised of those changes. Um, I'm more than happy to take any further questions that the committee have. Okay, thank you. Very comprehensive, thank you. Um, I think um, my only concern is that you, you have enough resources and that you feel that you um, c can cope with the level and, and any anything that may come up, you know, staff illness, uh, putting a dent in it. Um, so, uh, I mean, what's your opinion of, of that? I think general, I'm, I'm happier and I'm in relation to where we are with the plan because of the procurement that we've undertaken around um, ETEC for IT and also TIA as well. We can obviously call off work with those two organisations and again, they, they are able to facilitate that. We've got 55 um, audit days for TIA and we've got 20 audit days as outlined in the audit needs assessment for, for IT and those are, those are basically coming out of existing budgets and also savings with the Obviously, because I didn't start until the mid middle of June, so there were cost savings in, in there. If we do, one of the things that I do have is that I do have the facility to call across the principal auditor from Litchfield District Council as well, and she provides audit work as well for, for ourselves. Um, and also, from, from my perspective as well, I'm, I, and I think I said this at the July meeting, was again I'm also got that facility now to actually carry out audit work myself as well which I don't think my predecessor had the 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 facility to do so um, so again with again with a fair wind and also with the arrangements that we've got in place I I do place assurance that we will complete the the audit plan by the end of by the end of March I think I, I personally I was hoping to be further along on the where we were um, but obviously the the requirement to actually get in the in the resource and procure that resource took a little bit longer than I was expecting probably when I came to the committee in July okay no that, that sounds good it, it sounds that procuring really helped um, the, the situation so I'm glad to see that that's happened councillor people thank you chair I think you astutely put your finger on the point that uh, at the last meeting you were confident that you'd be able to shoot forward and we've probably gone forward not quite as fast um so you know you're making progress but not quite as much as you wanted um the point i'd like to raise is with regard to shared legal services i understand that uh, they're having some difficulty in maintaining the numbers of staff uh, that they plan to have um and that therefore work is in effect having to be out shall we say as opposed to being done by people we we had as paid for within the um, plan are you confident that you've got you can audit what's going on because it strikes me that it's one thing to audit an arrangement where they're billing us for numbers of hours based on an agreement we've already got another where they're having to say well actually in order to cover this capacity within the department we're having to go to a firm of solicitors in order to supply that gap so I, I just just ask you when you're doing that audit to to have a look at that side of it 
um, because it, it strikes me as that is a very difficult one to pin down for value for money, particularly because you're faced with a short term requirement to get a certain program approved or checked. Um, and some of these, especially with HSF, could be quite expensive contractual. Um, you know, most contract lawyers for the construction industry don't come cheap. I used to know the one who worked on the Channel Tunnel and his um, his his commanding rate was not <laughs> not not one that left you wanting to be employed for more hours than was needed. So I, I just I wonder, worry that that is going to be tough to audit and keep within budget, bearing in mind that apparently there's a shortage of legal uh, qualified legal people available to local authorities. Yeah, the current the current shared service arrangement is with South Staffordshire, um, and again, one of the things that we have looked at and and we we have reviewed on on that side of things, as with any with 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 any of the shared services, also having a look at the part the partners within that shared service. Now, my principal auditor at Litchfield has reviewed that um, both from the Litchfield perspective and also the Tamworth perspective as well. And again, as part of that as part of that review, we're not only looking at, shall we say, the nuts and bolts and the financial aspects, but we're also having a look at how that's working as well within the within the within the sort of shared service partnership. Um, and again, that's where we involve management from both authorities in relation to that that audit from that side yeah, of things. My concern is, you know, examples have been given to me that advice was not checkable because people have moved on um, and that, you know, if you can't fill gaps and you're having to bring in a premium to pay for the replacement, then how do you audit the value for money? And, and I appreciate you're very skilled at these things. So all, all I'm saying is, as a member and as a member of this committee, I'm aware there's a, a difficult area there and I'm I'm alerting you to that in my capacity as someone who, you know, is a is a member keeping an eye on what goes on. It's nothing, you know. I'm not in any way saying anything's wrong as such. But what I'm saying is, if you can't get the staff and you're having to pay over the odds, then the cost pressures and your ability to audit them become even more important. Yeah. Thank you. I'll, I'll take that on board, councillor, and 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 take that forward. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, councillor. People. Thank you, Andrew. Okay. Uh, any anybody got any questions or queries, comments on that item? Okay. Uh, then our recommendations are that uh, committee endorse attached progress reports. The committee endorse the audit needs assessment in relation to the IT plan for 2021-22, which looks sounds good to me. Um, I'm happy to move it. Looking for a second, please. Happy to second, chair, if you wish. But I think uh, somebody else came in first. Got to you there with the hand. Thank you. Right, all those in favour of moving that, thank you. Right. Unanimous. Right, thank you. Um, so, uh, item eight is the is the timetable, uh, which we very rarely say anything about, um, although uh, our meet, next meeting is um, February. <laughs> Seems a long way away, doesn't it? But uh, it'll soon be here, and Christmas. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but... Um, yeah, uh, I mean, it is what it is uh, there. I mean, um, the, there is going to be some, just for the record, discussion on future high street fund um, uh, in our confidential item a bit later, but just for the record, at some point, slotted into this timetable will potentially be. Um, uh, and I want to, to make this bit public that we, we may be looking at um, an audit committee, um, either working group or subcommittee for the future high street fund. Uh, which we'll go into a bit more detail um, when we do get to that confidential item, but uh, I just wanted to to state that for the public record. So, uh, in, in under the timetable. Okay, uh, which brings me. Oh, sorry. Yes, sir. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to mention and, and highlight within the February meeting we have got a review of the audit committee effectiveness. So I will be sending round basically questionnaire sector effectively around skills and potential st skill gaps that committee members may have may feel that they have um, and again we can feed that then into f into any form of, of, of training going forward I'd just like to bring that to 
committee attention. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I mean, we um, we can we can neglect that a little bit. Um, I mean, I must admit, I was late with mine last time. I got my hand slapped, but um, yeah, um, when they are sent out, if you can just put whatever you can, even if it's just a word, a couple of words, or I'm not sure on this, um, or whatever. I think the thing was with that form, it was just it seemed a little bit cumbersome to fill out. It wasn't. It was the formatting was a bit rubbish, to be honest. Um, so um, it, it may have not helped a little bit but um yeah uh, if you can just keep an eye out for that that'd be great okay um item nine then is excluding uh, exclusion of the press and public uh, under the provisions of the local authorities executive arrangements i'm going to read all that out um so uh, at the time of the agenda uh, no representations have been received that the the part of the meeting that we're going on to uh, should be open to the public, so I'm going to move that we uh, we move into confidential and uh, end the public stream of the meeting. So I'm going to move that. Looking for a seconder, please, Councillor Thurgood, and we're all happy to do that. All in favour? Thank you. Right, we'll uh, we'll move into confidential after a short pause for the stream to end.